Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 381, that's 381, that's tres ocho uno. How you doing? Como estas, mi amigos? Bien. ¿Qué tal? Cool. Amazing. Great. How am I? You know, same old, same old, hang on in there. I've got a face color, cover colored. Well, I am a tad colored pardon the pun but i have got a face covered in some sort of um oily moisturizer that i've been testing out this past week so if you see any sheen coming off your screen please excuse i put on some sunshades block your eyes with your hands simulating that you're wearing a baseball cap or if you can lower down your monitor i'm sorry for the glare but welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for supporting. As per usual, if it's your first time tuning in via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please download the show, give it a five star review, share it with your friends, send it in a text message to someone that you like, then put it um, in the post box with a self enveloped stamp and then wait back for the results. No, I'm joking. Just download it, share it, you know, all that good stuff. That would be much appreciated. And of course, if you want to support the show via Patreon, you're more than welcome to. There's a link down below on Patreon patreon.com for just agostino for as little as one dollar or the equivalent of one pound a month you can get access to my entire audio library as well as this show in full audio format before it comes out anywhere else before it's available on youtube before it's available on spotify on itunes you can get it directly all in full directly through patreon only to my early subscribers if you want to back the show you want to support the show you want to contribute to my alcohol consumption today i'm only drinking water but you know the vibes usually you know what i'm on you know my game you know my body so if you want to contribute to that make sure you click the patreon link that should be in the description it should be the pinned comment on youtube in the description of the podcast to listen to wherever you see it click that patreon link subscribe get involved donate to the show um send a couple of coins my way add to the fund help a brother out i'm extending the hand don't slap it away all that good stuff please if you can yes yeah, that'd be nice right that'd be nice yeah that'd be that's what nice to end it anyway Woo! we're back we're back we're back i'm refreshed i'm ready to go i've just done a couple sets in the gym i've been doing start i've been doing a what starting strength the last two, couple of weeks now heading into sober october which is going to be a monumental month of um you know um a monumental month of self-discovery of self-actualization of realignment i can't wait to get started i can't wait to have a cleanse i can't wait to do all the things that i've been promising myself i would do during lockdown but of course you know lockdown has probably brought out the worst in me i think in most people in terms of procrastination in terms of making excuses in terms of being lazy it's definitely sort of um allowed everybody to kind of take a foot off the pedal and i think in general we can't afford to do that because we only have one life right even if it's as shitty as it is now at the moment and it's not necessarily going in the way that we'd want it to go we do uh, it to ourselves to put our best foot forward um and try to squeeze the most at the no the most we can out of the life that we have in this current moment i know it's difficult i know it's hard i know there are other things you probably wish you could be doing um then you know training running eating healthy you know staying off your phone all that good stuff but in the long run i guarantee setting those kind of good practices or those good habits now will probably see you in a better place in the future but for myself personally um i've been training a lot i've been doing starting strength that's been going really well i think once sub october or not i think i will once sub october kicks in i'm going to ramp up the running because that's been something i've been kind of taking my fourth the pedal because it's flipping difficult that's basically it anyone that tells you otherwise is a liar running is probably the hardest thing to do in terms of working out it's harder than going to a gym it's harder than swimming it's harder than doing any martial arts it's it's gru it's just cruciate that's why a lot of you know combat uh oh yeah a lot of martial artists anyway and especially the professional ones in the ufc and stuff that's why they tend to go for long runs even boxers right long runs are seen as a bit of a punishment are seen as a necessary evil in order for you to up your cardiovascular levels and unfortunately it seems like the only thing that you can do running on the road or right, actually on road running not treadmill running that can actually improve your cardiovascular base there's no other way to do it and sometimes if you add the if you had the wild card of football, right? If you tr if you play football, even on the weekends, even during the week with your friends on the five side, you know how different it is to go running or even to cycle daily, you know, 10 to 12 miles per day or some nonsense that you, whatever some people are doing at the moment now, right? Or what I used to do, like nearly a half a marathon a day. That is completely different than actually running on a football pitch. It's it, like, it doesn't even compare. So 
a, a lot of the time you see yourself like training outside, trying to get a good level, good base of fitness. And then once you step on the football pitch, you start blowing out your ass, blowing out of your ass, sorry. So um, unfortunately running is a necessary evil. It's probably the best. It probably benefits me the best whenever I start running, whenever I kind of up my weekly mileage, um, uh, yeah, intake, uptake. Yeah, whenever I, I up my kind of weekly mileage, the weight or the pounds just start melting off me at the moment um, or in the past anyway, prior, especially if I did like 10, 15 miles a week, it didn't have to be anything that crazy. As long as I got out there consistently at least four to five times a week, I was fine. It come, the weight kept pouring off of me. So it's definitely something I want to get back on as soon as uh, Sober October starts, which will be in a couple of days. That should be awesome. And um, what else is going on? So that's going to be good. I'm not even sure if, if um, I don't think they are because I haven't seen them mentioning anything, but I don't think the Joe Rogans and the uh, Tom Seguras and Bert Kreish and Irish Affair are actually doing Sober October this year. It's usually something that I've kind of, it's something I've discovered via the Joe Rogan podcast. I wasn't necessarily aware of the whole Sober October thing prior to that. So it's a bit of a shame if I don't have, you know, the uh, ability to do it um, together with these guys, um, you know, over the interwebs. But I'd assume so, you know, with Joe moving to Texas and, you know, the world being as it is at the moment and just j in general, I guess a lot of the stand-up comedians, especially that the ones that do live in LA, are, you know, are all on different sort of like paths. It feels like COVID or the pandemic has sort of thrust people into some decisions that they probably wouldn't have done, they wouldn't have taken if it wasn't for the pandemic, right? Um, I think Joe Diaz mentioned it recently on the Brendan Shaw podcast that he was on talking about, you know, even though he was always thinking about leaving LA, um, the pandemic sort of pushed him in that, in that direction sooner than it would have um, so I'd assume because of everything going on they're probably just going to take their foot off the pedal and be like you know what if we do do it let's just do it remotely where we are or whatever but they're not really organising it or putting it together which is a shame really isn't it um, all things considered because again it was one of the things I sort of look forward to you know seeing these guys compete with each other via the podcast and of course doing your own little separate challenge but for me I've got some pillars in place that I kind of want to do um it will probably be involve um spending as little time as i can on the internet it'll probably spend it'll involve a lot more time my time reading and writing it'll probably spend a lot of my time meditating a lot of my time running working out watching movies um catching up on tv series but no mindless browsing right and just doing all the things that educationally that I kind of wished I was doing prior. I was doing it, of course, prior to the pandemic. But like I said, the pandemic has kind of um, given me an excuse to be lazy, to be a, a procrastinator, which are things I kind of try to push against as much as I can. It's within my nature. I think most people within the nature, especially if you're of the creative leanings, you, you tend to sometimes think to yourself, oh, because you're thinking creatively, because you have these creative thoughts that you've somehow done the work, when really the execution, the deliverable, the actual final product is what matters it doesn't matter how much you know stuff you have in theory um things that you have sketched out in your mind quote unquote or even things that you have plopped up on a line sheet i always say prior that one of the things i hate in streetwear is the fact that a lot of my especially some of my designer friends on social media tend to always post their line sheets and stuff they're working on or to crowdsource ideas like hey guys i'm working on this you guys think it's a good idea and it's like i always hate that sort of stuff i prefer the people that just show and prove that you know even if, you, even if it's even if it means you, you just making one talk for yourself i much prefer that than seeing a line sheet of a hoodie that tells me nothing i'd much rather you go to the you know, because you do learn a lot. I remember even for myself when I was um, mulling around with starting my own t-shirt brand and I kind of just iron, what did I do? Yeah, I heat transferred a couple of logos and some t-shirts and I did a couple of run of trucker hats. That taught me a lot more about um, production, manufacturing, uh, you know, in general than I would have ever learned just kind of Googling stuff and watching people on YouTube. Just the action alone, doing it, finding out how many minimums are, finding out the color prints that needed, the way you need to finish the artwork, um, you know, different finishes on the actual garment itself, blah, -de blah, 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 um, how, you know, how quickly they can turn stuff like that around, when it can be delivered, how it's going to be delivered. All these sort of things are really, really important in terms of getting a better understanding. And again, you don't gain the understanding unless you actually do it yourself. You actually, you know, um, uh, take the risk, take some money out from your account, put that aside and actually go and invest in your dream. I think that's one thing I've realized, I remember listening to when 
I was um, briefly working on a project with Samuel Ross from a Cold War. This is early in the in the in the in his journey on the, from doing what he's doing with the Cold War. Right, a Cold War might end up being the UK version of like Armani. Right, it might end up being that much of a behemoth of a powerhouse. Right, he might take it to like heights that people have never probably imagined. And you can also think how crazy it is thinking of how he started. Right, um, dying. Uh, you know, pairs of Air Force Ones, removing the laces, stitching his own logo on it, just so you could have something that kind of spoke to his brand, something custom on the runway. You know, like that, like the lack of resources, but then being really resourceful with what he has available, flipping awesome. But I remember him saying once when we were filming something, something along the lines of like, "Oh, um, if you can't, yeah, something, something, something really nash, naff, like if you can't." invest in your own dreams why would you think someone else would be willing to invest in them right and i think the essence of it was like hey you should be taking whatever money you have and trying to actualize whatever dream you're trying to make in order to kind of give you some energy give you some incentive to keep on going because if you keep everything on line sheet if you keep everything on a psd if you keep everything in a sketchbook if you keep everything in a notepad you won't necessarily have the motivation to keep um working your crappy nine to five that's basically funding your side project right but if you have the ability to like you know imagine you came back from a tough day at work and suddenly you find a package outside of your door and it's a fedex package from a design firm that's helping you um on your new logo or that's helping you on some creative directing that you're kind of looking for insight on or whatever or it's a doc or it's a kind of breakdown of the fees that's going to cost for you to manufacture a certain thing that will give you the pep that's needed to kind of see another day in your work and that's something that i kind of for I saw in my own life as well, which I thought was really beneficial when I was a uh, DJing, especially prior to the pandemic, every weekend that gave me such life, like being able to know that I have this thing on the outside that really commands my attention, that kind of requires me to be creative, that requires me to be innovative, that requires me to think of like new set list ideas, new themes, new um, sound textures, all these cool things. So whilst I'm working, whilst I'm at work, sometimes I'm sometimes it's distracted, don't get me wrong, because sometimes it's something, it's something that I kind of look back on and a bit regretful, you know, being a little bit distracted at work and not really taking it seriously because, you know, at the end of the day, I always kind of felt like, hey, I have more that I can offer than just working this crappy nine to five. But I think there is something to be said for honoring the job that you have, for honoring any position that you get given where somebody is essentially paying you money and allowing you to kind of and basically funding your lifestyle. You should have a level of respect and humility that should be that should be really evident. People should kind of see oh, oh wow okay we know you don't really want to be here but you're really trying your darndest and putting your best foot forward um in order to make this position work for you not only for yourself so you learn something but also so it benefits this company and your team um overall and i think that's something to be said for that really and, uh, and in general anyway i think it will really cause I'm, not, I'm not even a big believer in that even when it comes to references but i think if you are a big reference person and you do believe in karmic value it does go some way to be like really respectful of the position that you have regardless of how crappy it may be um just so that you can have some good karma come your way somewhere along the line when you're in a sticky situation um but yeah i think looking back on it i would i could have probably done a little bit better in some of the position i had some of the jobs i had i could have probably put my best foot forward a bit more but i do have to admit even when I was low and in my darkest times, I really did benefit a lot from knowing, okay, cool. I had this other thing going on outside of work that is nothing to do with this stuff. That's maybe a little bit more creatively stimulating something that I kind of, even just coming back home to read a book would really hold me down, man. Or just knowing I'm going to read a book on my way back on the, like, you know, on the other ground, I'll be like, yes, I can't wait to dig into my book again and kind of finish it before I get home or to grab some notes or to mull over an idea that would just at least hold me. So I think the pandemic has definitely, um, crystallized that idea and really kind of uh, made it clear exactly what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing. I think most people know that, right? Especially if you're um, overindulging in like drinks and alcohol, sorry, alcohol and food, you would know now, you know, if, if you don't know now, you probably should lay off some of the booze, some of the food, you will never find out because this is, this has been like the perfect time to indulge in. Trust me, I've indulged. I've kind of gone a bit crazy, but I think now comes a time to kind of address the balance um, and get back to some semblance of normality in order for us to kind of have, have ourselves in the best possible shape so that in case 
stuff does go back to normal next year, right? Which we're all hoping it does, right? Because I think, in myself included, I'm completely fed up with this whole lockdown. I've had enough. I want to just move on and do what I want to do. Um, I think most people are in that kind of um, lane now. I think um, the best way to do that is to kind of give yourself the chance to recover, to give your body a chance to have a bit of a break, right? Um, and your liver, lay off the booze and some of the, um, you know, not so beneficial food and kind of hope that by the new year, you'll be in a brand new pace. You'll be like a new body who's this sort of vibe. But yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Um, Again, I'll, I'll probably put a list together in the next couple of days of the stuff that I'm actually planning to do during Sober October in case other people are interested. But I think it's definitely something to look at if you are thinking of make, making some change. Why not do it during October? You know, it's a dead month anyway. Nothing's going on. Halloween is basically cancelled in most places unless you live, I guess, in New Zealand or parts of Southeast Asia. There is no Halloween for you. You can't go and trick or treat. You can't go to a party. So why not take the opportunity to um, get back to some semblance of normality? Anyway, jam pack show for you today. Loads of stuff to get into, loads of stuff to dig into. So make sure you grab yourself a drink, a snack, or whatever it is that you like to nibble on. And let's get on in the show. First things first, congratulations to Izzy, who won the middleweight, who kind of kept his belt, sorry, um, against Paolo Costa over the weekend and big up everyone too that joined in on the show i did a watch along live stream i'll be doing a few more of those i did it on Streamyard, which i'm not really a big fan of i'm gonna just stick to doing it on um obs i guess Streamyard works better because you get the chance to sort of like get the messages pop up on your screen right uh via live chat which is quite cool so you don't have to kind of go through it um on the actual app itself you can, and the app itself is a bit clunky online um i don't like how it shares screens but i'm going to start using obs and just start streaming regularly and i guess having my phone to the side and then answering questions that way or just having this the chat bot um um sort of loaded up on my laptop screen i'm sure i can find another workaround to sort of make that work but big up everyone that joined in <laughs> if you had a watch along stream that was really fun might do a few more of those for football as well maybe going coming forward but yeah what a dominant performance from izzy man Israel Adesanya versus Paolo Costa, the main event on a two main card fight, right? Fight night card. I think the co-main event was um, Dominic Reyes v. Jan Bachakovsky. A bit of an upset in that one because I guess most people coming into that fight just assumed Dominic Reyes would win uh, based on his performance against John Jones, where a lot of people believe that he might have won that on split decision, or at least it, at the worst, it could have been a draw. And I think, unfortunately, Dominic Reyes always also bought into that um, hype and thought that he could come into the ring, not 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 nonchalant, but he thought it would be enough just turning up, throwing a couple of hands, and he could basically put away John Blachikovsky. Um, but of course, as we've proven, as has been proven over the years with the USC, no fight is a foregone conclusion. All fighters are dangerous. Um, the UFC, as stingy as they can be with the pay, they're very, very good with the matchmaking. For the most part, you quickly realize who is good, who is basically a title contender and who isn't because they get matched up with each other very quickly. So if Jan Barkowski is getting matched up with Dominic Reyes, is there is obviously the opportunity that he can knock him out too and stop him. And as he did in that fight, he picked him apart. Um, with kicks and punches, probably I'd say a little bit similar to the approach that Israel Adesanya took with um, Paolo Costa. Of course, Dominic Reyes isn't as forward pressing as a Paolo Costa, but it was the same similar sort of fight. Jan basically kept um, Dominic Reyes at, at his basically length, um, basically did away with him as he pleased and sort of turned up the pressure towards the second round and basically fulfilled his promise where he said he was going to put him away in the second round. And it's impressive because he's, what, 37, 38 years old. You probably think that might be his last hurrah in terms of actually winning a championship. Um, you look at people like Chel Sonan, who people really rate and is into the UFC Hall of Fame. Never got, well, he got close actually, but he never actually won a title. So you know how difficult it is to actually win a championship belt, no matter who you're facing, no matter the state of the competition. Winning a belt is very, very difficult, especially in the UFC where you're constantly getting matched up against some of the best fighters within your division um you know every fight night or every card right so it's always a bit of a dog fight in that regard so for Jan to finally win it especially against somebody like Atomic Reyes who's coming off such an impressive performance against John Jones must do himself a world of confidence you obviously saw the change in his face when you're celebrating you kind of let out that kind of animalistic scream and then quite quickly he kind of it's sort of he sobered up and started realizing like the the um, the magnitude of what he's just done like he, he actually won the belt that was pretty cool to see him just kind of recollecting his thought, like being like, wow, man, I've actually done it. I've done it. I've won it. I've won it. Um, that was cool to see. 
And of course, he got a hero's welcome going back to Poland. There's a really cool video of him arriving at the airport and all the fans sort of ch chanting his name in a very Polish sort of way, right? Instead of kind of mobbing him like he would have done in maybe, you know, if he was English or something, they sort of like run up to him and just stand, you know, about five meters away and just start shouting his name in it in a really rhythmic sort of like monotone way. It's really awesome actually to see that. And of course, the main, the main card, the main fight, um, Izzy versus Paolo Costa now. I think, um, like a lot of people, I just assumed Izzy would win, right? But I also kind of thought to myself, you know what? UFC is mad, isn't it? I wouldn't be surprised if Kyle Costa just comes out, catches um, Izzy with something, or Izzy gets injured, or something happens and along the line, and you're tuning in, you're seeing Paolo Costa grinding and pounding Israel Desanya, right? That wouldn't surprise me if that did happen too. But looking at some of the fights that Paolo Costa's had, looking at his lack of real testing, looking at the lack of competition he's had in terms of actual ranked fighters, it did make me think that maybe, especially when I look when, you know, as the fight was drawing closer, maybe Paolo Costa had been rushed um, a little bit. His opportunity, right? He'd been rushed through the ranks a little bit too soon and he probably got his title defense or title chance or shot at the title a little bit too soon in his career because the fighters he's fought, um, compared to what Izzy has had to go through to win the belt, so they don't even compare. It's not even close. But if, and and then of course you take into account his style and where he's pressing and he's always on the front foot. And you take into account Izzy being somebody that's a bit longer, who kind of fights on the back foot, who fights on the counter. It was a match made. It was a match made in heaven for Izzy and a match made in hell for Paulo Costa. And it did sort of transpire that way. Um, I think if anything. Um, Paolo Costa came into that fight having a lot more respect for Izzy than he kind of let on. He didn't sort of like try and walk him down. He didn't try his bully tactics in the ring. He did at some points try to goad Izzy into like an exchange in the middle of the octagon. Like saying, yeah, you come, you come here, you come here. But of course, Izzy's too smart for that. He's too experienced, too long in the tooth to sort of like succumb to that kind of peer pressure-y machismo thing that can cut that low, that low you into kind of like questioning your manhood, right? You question your manhood and then you kind of get lulled into a dogfight. And then, you know, and that person's of course, that Paolo Costa, he's suited to a dogfight. So that's what he once so um, I'm glad that um, Izzy kind of resisted that urge but apart from that we didn't really see much from Paolo Costa now that could be because Izzy shut him down completely but I do think um, the unexplainables like you know Izzy's feints um, uh, Izzy's jab uh, Izzy's ab ability to sort of like essentially fight from range really did confuse Paolo Costa and he had no answer he didn't know how to get close to him because you know you try and get close to um, Izzy and as he says he's got position he might not have power but he's got position and if he's got precision, as soon as you get close to him he's going to be uppercutting you elbowing you right hook left hook kicking you kneeing you right and then moving out of the way and uh, back out into the center of the ring center of the octagon commanding it once again um so that's why he's a real pleasure to watch in that regard because he has a very conventional uh thai kickboxing style but also a very conventional sort of like um what's it what do they call it is it karate go what's that thing called kick karate you know the one that um that stephen thompson does he has that kind of stance too where he's always kind of bouncing on his feet hands down um can throw from loads of weird angles uh regular stance south pole whatever do you know what i mean um ambidextrous in that way too just a really 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 clever uh fighter and somebody who kind of is also very resistant to the to the takedowns right that's one thing i thought what might happen i thought maybe Paulo costa because supposedly he has he has a supposedly this guy has a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt now from what i've learned online again i'm a casual fan but from what i learned black belts aren't just black belts everywhere black belts sort of like um sort of have a gradient in their relevancy or gradient in their kind of authenticity based on basically the school that they, that person's going to um who they're basically being taught under and of course the fighter right because sometimes if you're like i don't know if you're Zac Efron, you could probably get a blue belt quicker than some people can because you're Zac Efron, right? They they might kind of just, you know, uh, speed you through some of the ranks just for the look and to get you on social media and shit. I don't know. And, and just in general, just maybe to, uh, as a favor. So not all black belts are kind of are, the, are made the same. So I kind of thought that was the case because there's no way that Paulo Costa would have black belt jujitsu knowledge in his back pocket. This is his entire UFC career and not use it once. I don't think he even used it in... Um, in the contender series that he did when he was in Brazil. He didn't. I'm pretty sure he might have done a couple of under underhooks against a cage against somebody, but no real like actual jujitsu jujitsu that I can actually think of. Did he choke somebody out though? Or am I mistaken? He, he did, didn't he, right? 
did he rear naked choke someone? I think I've got it in my head him rear naked choke someone, but I don't know. But in general, he hasn't really used it to a level that he probably should do if he has got uh, a black belt in jiu-jitsu because you would imagine if he's able to mix in his, you know, his obvious uh, ability at sort of like Thai kickboxing style, right? His ability to kick, uh, switch kick, right hook, uh, um, kicks to the body. He would be really, really dangerous with the addition of jujitsu into his game. But again, sort of suddenly turning that on against Israel Desanya, the title fight was never going to happen. <clears throat> Most fighters would kind of agree to the idea that, hey, I'm going to do whatever got me to the dance, right? Meaning whatever kind of got me here is what I'm going to continue doing. I'm not going to suddenly change up my game. That can usually be the recipe for disaster. So I'm glad he didn't do that. But God damn it, that was a one-sided fight. Izzy controlled that fight from a minute one to the end of the, to basically the end of the fight when he essentially TKO'd him at the what beginning of the second. Um, It started off with a kick to the head, which um obviously wobbled um Paolo Costa. And then of course he did that really great thing that he did against... um. Robert Whittaker as well where if you get in really close with him he has this really weird ability and really clever kind of way or yeah really clever way and ability to generate a lot of power by just simply leaning back and sort of swinging from that position so when you get really close to him you think you can hit him and he's obviously got that really amazing sort of like matrix style where you can kind of lean out and sort of you can miss you know especially when you're trying to do some spinning wall kicks whatever they may be they might be a bit telegraphed for such a kind of you know long in the tooth tire boxing guy but um or tight hip boxing guy but he has a really cool ability when he's ever in a clinch and someone's trying to get right in his body kind of get you know trying to basically as close as they can to hit him he'll lean back and then kind of throw as many punches as you can and i guess towards palacosti did the same thing that one was really clever because he ended up sort of purposely um shifting his way i think to the right uh, Paolo Costa took the opportunity to obviously go for the kick with his right leg to the body. Um, Adesanya anticipated it, grabbed his leg and just started wading in on him as he's holding his leg, let go. And then as, as Paolo Costa was starting to cover up to come forward, he kind of laced him with a couple of hits. He goes down, he follows him to the ground. And of course, you know, good night, sweetheart. And then towards the end, he does a little bit of a dry hump in order to kind of take the piss. But wow, what a dominant, what a dominant, dominant victory from probably one of the best middleweights that I've seen in a long time, especially in the UFC. Amazing, amazing, amazing fighter. Um, just definitely um, box office, definitely someone that you would pay to watch, especially when you consider his style, his approach and his overall confidence. And just, again, um, as small as he looked against Paolo in the beginning of the fight, he grew as the fight went on. I'm not sure if that was just me. I, I did start the fight thinking, wow, man, Paolo Costa looks like an animal compared, looks like Yoro Romero um, compared to Izzy. But then once the fight started to progress and he started to get confident, I don't know why for some reason Paolo Costa started to shrink and Izzy started to get bigger, longer. You know what I mean? And that's the thing I think people don't realise. Like, Izzy isn't like Neil Magny. Or even Neil Magny too. I think these people, when you see him in real life, it's a whole different game. People can talk a big game about them being skinny in comparison. It's like when you when you get a regular bodybuilding guy standing next to one of those massive power lifters, right? They all look small. But I think small is relative. And I think, again, in the UFC, it's never really, about, I'd imagine in most martial arts, it's never really about the muscles, right? The muscles can be are just simply aesthetic. It's more about um, whatever that kind of torsile strength is on the inside, right? That kind of, you know, that toughness that you need that doesn't really maybe exhibit itself in pecs and biceps and stuff. But yeah, again, credit performance for Israel Adesanya holds a belt now supposedly he's um waiting for the winner of Whitaker v Cannoneer um of course if it's Cannoneer then that would be an interesting fight if it's Whitaker I don't think it's going to end up any other different way than it had done previously but let's see what happens in the middleweight it's a very interesting division loads of interesting fighters they're ready to go and chomping at the bit chomping 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 at the bit to go so let's move on, move on, move on. What else do we have to talk about here? Um, bah, 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 bah. Okay, let's talk about this, right? And I'm, again, I'm, I feel a bit uneasy talking about it because, again, it's all my business and I feel a bit bad, but it's just a bit interesting to see from the outside looking in. Um, this page I follow called Fashion Demics. You know, you get the drift. It's essentially the fashion slash streetwear version of a DJ Academics page. So loads of... Um, news and insights concerning some of the people within fashion that we all know and love and um one of the one interesting bit of news that sort of crept on my time that i saw exactly through fashion demics was this news and the first screenshot sorry go back here 
is this one and it's a screenshot from uh, this guy called uh, Jonathan Cruz that says was showing Matthew Williams the designer and founder of Elites and also I guess the creative director now of Givenchy also a former Bin Trill Virgil Kanye West acolyte um, him alongside with Blondie McCoy right um, one of the skaters that for Palace you know a brand that I fucking hate I think it's garbage um, but um yeah, there's Blondie, there's Matthew. And the caption says, Matthew Williams flexing his fit while his wife just had a baby with Blondie McCoy as a mood, right? And I thought, what? So I didn't really understand what was going on. And then, of course, the next picture is, um, you know, uh, Matthew Williams doing what he does, flexing his fit like he always does, right? Showing off some unreleased Alix merch, maybe a little sneak peek on what he's doing with Givenchy, maybe some stuff he does with his own namesake brand with Nike. You know, you know the vibes, innit? Then I went into Blondie McCoy's um, account. I thought, hold on, what are they talking about? Him having a baby and then i clicked and i was like god damn it this guy had a whole baby right blondie mccoy's got a baby i guess with um uh with what appears to be jennifer williams or formerly who was jennifer williams um who was uh, what matthew williams's wife and mother of his three children i think so i think they got three kids i'm not sure if one of the kids is matthews from another marriage or whatever but i'm pretty sure they've got more than one which is pretty weird isn't it pretty weird pretty freaky that um, somebody like a blondie who I'm assuming is friends with Matthew, right? Who probably, they probably hanged out in a fashion. Again, friends is a loose term because in streetwear, in the scene in general, friendship can only, only goes as far as the favors someone's willing to give you or what you're willing to give them, right? There's no real, real friendship. It's all a bit loose, all a bit fake. It is what it is. That is the game. But still, right? From the image that they sort of portray, everyone seems like they're family. They're very close, right? Um, they're all in the same scene. They're doing these things together. And now suddenly... This guy, you know, I'm guessing Matthew and Jennifer broke up. People break up, people move on and stuff. But wouldn't you be a little bit grossed out, a little bit you know, weirded out if one of your scene friends then suddenly hooked up with one of you, basically the mother of your children and essentially had another whole baby with her again? That's really bizarre. And again, from the woman's side of things, like, isn't it fairly interesting that both, like, what, one guy ends up being, you know, the one guy you end up hooking up with in the first place is Matthew Williams, who ends up being, at the time, I think he was just finishing up working with Lady Gaga and then he decided to move on with Kanye and do all the amazing stuff he's done. And now, coincidentally, the next guy you move on to happens to be Blondie McCoy. It's not just some regular dude. It's another clouded up uh, ninja within the street west, uh, what you call it, social circle sphere. It's really odd. Again, congratulations to him. Baby looks cute, of course, I guess. Can you really say congratulations when you don't know the people? It's a, it comes off a bit a bit empty, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know these people, so congratulations, I guess. I guess the baby's healthy. That's a good thing. But God damn it, this is weird, isn't it? Don't you think that's a tiny, tiny bit weird? Like a little bit weird? Wouldn't you be weirded out a tiny bit if your if your mother of your child was like shacked up with somebody that you went to some um gallery opening with at flipping protein studios and now suddenly you turn around and a whole baby is cackling there in the corner with your mother of your missus there as well. It's like the mother of your children's there. It's so bizarre, isn't it? I find it so odd. And again, I shouldn't be surprised, isn't it? A former or an, an actual palace skater doing something like this, isn't it? Those guys are like, you know, when you when you start wearing tracksuit bottoms with loafers and pretending like you're from East Ham and wearing sovereign rings, isn't it? Like, what, what do you expect, isn't it? This is probably the nature of the game. But I just find it incredibly, incredibly bizarre. Again, congrats to him, I guess. Congrats. Again, I don't know these people, so it, c it can come across a bit disingenuous. It probably is disingenuous because I don't necessarily care. But interesting to see from the outside looking anyway, regardless... Um, yeah, man, I thought that was odd. Very, 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 very odd. But hey, what do I know? Move on. Um, we got some big, 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 big news. Um, Twenty One Savage has just announced um his sequel to his hit breakthrough mixtape album Savage Mode, Savage Mode Two. Um, entirely produced by Metro Boom. I'm assuming. Um, the cover was released via um Twenty One Savage's Instagram. Uh, pen and Pexel. Um, you know, influence cover. If you don't know what Pen and Pexel are, get your research up. Right. Um, no limit, cash money. You know those kind of old school days. And again, if you're if you're like a newer school fan and you're younger, you probably would recognize the mixtape covers from the stuff that Space Coat Space Coat's Pub did in the back in the day and Little B as well. But essentially, that sort of style of mixtape is something. To taken from the guys over at Pen and Pexel. I'm assuming, I guess they're Houston. I'm pretty sure they're Houston, right? That's sort of like, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're from Houston. But um, check them out. Really amazing uh, collective of graphic designers, kind of, you know, responsible for some of the most legendary covers. I can think of covers from Mercedes, um, covers from Juvenile, 
Um, loads of other people as well they've done in do, during that era so definitely check them out but yeah i'm 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 very much interested with this project again savage mode for me was quite possibly one of my most played albums of mixtapes of all time maybe up there with maybe ds2 um from future a really phenomenal project from top to bottom uh one of the rare instances that you see a kind of new, maybe this it's a more than norm now especially with little baby that was basically our introduction to 21 savage was that entire mixtape right um so seeing kind of how he's progressed in the industry seeing how he's changed as an artist seeing how he's really changed as a man even right he's hardly in the news he sort of keeps his head down minds his own business works with who he wants to work with and has really evolved and every project since that has basically got better as a rapper which has been really cool to watch as a fan but um I think sonically, just from start to beginning, it was probably one of the best, most sinister, frightening mixtape you listen to in your entire life. It could literally be a score for a movie quite easily. Um, I'm a big, big, big fan of it. Um, big fan of Metro Boomin, of course. Um, his productions have, I'm going to say, waned a little bit. I think it might be self-inflicted. I do think he, he did kind of burn himself out somewhat, especially during his heyday. Um it seems like he did take a bit of a break. I think he worked uh, a lot on the Weekends album. But apart from that, he's been a bit quiet. Um, I think he's kind of decided to work, I guess, with some of his close friends and family instead of kind of, you know, putting random placements everywhere um, for the bag. I'm sure he's probably um, got enough credits there to sustain him for now. And um, what better way to kind of focus your energy than working with The Weeknd, you know, on that amazing album. What was that? Is that Starboy? No, it wasn't Starboy. What was the album that he worked on recently? Not Star Boy. Da, 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 da. So I can get it over here. Bear with me. Mm -mm -mm. Oh yeah, he was on Slam Ball Three, innit? Yeah. What am I talking about? So this is um uh Metro Boomin's production credit. So 2013, you got Gunner Drip Season Three, of course, one standouts. Uh, from there, working on that, of course, I am was from 2018. Wow, man. That was, um, yeah, um, Tony Savage's last album. And then, of course, the work he did with Offset, Father of Four, which was a pretty lackluster project for me, um, all things considered. He worked on that entire project, actually, which is crazy um, to consider that. And, of course, the weekend after hours from this year. So he's been a little bit sporadic, especially when you look up at the stuff that he did in previous years, right? Look at the credits for 2017 alone. They're super long. And then you scroll down to 2018 onwards. And he's been very selective about who's working with Gunna, Lil J, DJ Esco, um, Ray Schmurder, Thomas Twins, Rich the Kid, Young Nudie, one of my favorites, Nicki Minaj, Lil, uh, Nicki, Lil Wayne, sorry, Belly, Lil Baby. And then 2019 Offset, James Blake, Solange, Lil Key, Quality Control, um, Control the Streets. Again, that was a very underrated project, isn't it? Probably a little bit too long um in in all way all one sense but yeah 100 100 racks pink toes with playboy Car no 100 racks with playboy kai pink toes with ghana was easily what two of my standout tunes so no surprise they're produced by ghana and produced by metro boom sorry gucci may with toba 2 and in 2020 the weekend after hours that's the only stuff he's done this this year point blank so apart from that so i guess yeah that's it really isn't it? so you can obviously see a little bit of a change in his approach when it comes to producing so i'll be interested to see if that means that he's cooked up some far more interesting things that he would have maybe sent out to other artists that he's given to 21 whether it'll look whether it'll be as tight and rigid thematically as um uh as what you call it savage mode one or the original savage mode or whether it'll be a little bit more experimental i'm interested to see what they do with it going forward i'm curious to see i think it's coming out this friday right which is what friday the what what is that friday coming up now or the friday coming is going to be the 2nd of October. So definitely check that out if you are that, if you're interested. I'm sure most people will be listening to this podcast, 21 Savage album coming out soon. Next on the list, what do we have here? Da, 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 da. Oh yeah, we have this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not worth so much. Oh, please bear with me with this mustache. I need to shave this shit down, man. It's really getting on my nerves. But anyway, so, um, as you're aware, COVID is sweeping the world, sweeping the nation, especially if you're in the UK. And it's been a really weird situation where university students have essentially been locked up in their dorms because I guess certain campuses have had a spike in cases, which has basically led to the schools or the universities deciding that students can't leave their rooms after quarantine until they get a handle on the situation. But it all essentially happened within the first couple of weeks 
of university starting, which is no surprise considering all these kids coming from different parts of the country into mingling, or mingling in general, as they have to say here in, 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 in the UK. Even if you do limit the amount of spaces that they can go to, there's only so much sort of physical distancing that you can do in university, especially when you're young and you're, you know, coming into one of maybe the most important stages of your life. Um, you know, a monumental stage, especially if you've been holed up at home with your parents, you're probably egging and desperate to burst out of your home. And the last thing you want to do when you do end up in campus is stay in your room. So these the headlines I'm reading from the BBC, such as the one I have on screen here that says COVID student chaos paying 30k a year and begging security for food. As distressing as it can be, my initial reaction is to be, of course, appalled and, of course, feel sorry for the students. But there is a part of me that's like, you know what? This might be actually a good thing that they actually get a chance to actually grow up because university can be a lot of things. It can be beneficial in terms of you understanding your place in society, um, growing up with it or developing as an adult with different people, knowing how to communicate with different people, work with different people, blah, 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 blah. But sometimes it can be a little bit detached from what's happening in the real world. And I guess it's some it can be a little bit comfort there can be some comfort in the in the fact that literally everybody is going through the same thing and even if you're a student right now you can't bury your head in the sand you can't be oblivious to what's going on you can't be negligent you definitely have to keep your head in a swivel and wear your mask and all that good stuff from the malarkey because unfortunately the virus doesn't have any it doesn't um stipulate you know when it suddenly kind of creeps up on you it doesn't care about a curfew it doesn't care if you're on campus it doesn't care if it's your first year it doesn't care if you're on a foundation year it doesn't it does not give a crap so it's an article here from bbc it says the following it says a student has told the bbc that the international students are being forgotten in the covid crisis reese chamberlain who's studying at university of edinburgh claims british students or foreign students sorry who are self-isolating are being forced to call security begging for food which already i mentioned prior because we've got i've got a campus next to where i live that is essentially um, ninety percent populated by Chinese students, right? Who are coming here to study fashion or media, or whatever they're studying, and those courses are already exorbitantly overpriced, right? Very much overrated too, right? They don't, they're not worth what they're, they're not worth the paper they're printed. Let's just say that. But of course, most of them are coming for the experience. They're coming for the look. They come for an opportunity to live in a, in a bustling city, have a home to themselves, you know, whatever it is, that it is they're doing. But I was just looking at it thinking to myself, it's bad enough if you're paying nine to 10 grand or five to 10 grand per year being a UK student. That's what they pay for the tuition fees in the UK. Imagine if you're an international student and you're paying 30K per year, you know, right? It's definitely not worth the money, especially um, under a pandemic. It continues here. It says, he said calls and emails to students' welfare are being unanswered. He said, university said it was supporting all students who are self-isolating. The 18-year-old international relations student from New York says he is preparing to pack and fly home as soon as his period of self-isolation is over. Jesus. Reese chose the University of Edinburgh because it offered him everything he was looking for. He said, I chose Edinburgh because I thought because it looked like a great uh, diverse university with students from 195 countries with a historic city and campus it was something i could could wouldn't find in the u.s i was looking forward to a completely different way of life and a different surroundings than my new people um my experience coming into edinburgh was great the people were nice i had to self i stayed for 14 days when i arrived into scotland but i knew that would be the case okay no problem there the three days of freedom i had were amazing i climbed um off a seat and it was fantastic um, but those three days came before um, one of his flatmates at Pollock Halls, the university's large accommodation site, tested positive for COVID-19. This put Reese back into self-isolation for a fortnight. At the same time, infections blew up at the university across the country, leading to students being banned from socialising in bars and pubs. So imagine, imagine, imagine how annoyed, how, how frustrating it must be to be that kind of student, right? You already make, you already decide to come over to the UK or to come over to Great Britain to study in Scotland, to study in the University of Edinburgh. You have plenty of universities you go to in america i'm sure members of his family are telling him you're a bloody idiot what you're doing just stay home you decide to take the brave step to go to another place to go to another country to surround yourself with new and interesting people you're already quarantining when you arrive be like you know what i knew that was going to happen you have three years of freedom quote unquote and then you suddenly turn up to university and you have to be holed up in your room again for another 14 days so you essentially paid 14 you essentially paid what 30k for a month holiday in your in a room in an in a, yeah to yeah you basically paid 30k to stay in the airbnb for a month mad 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 um 
uh, da, 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 when he chose to travel to the UK in the pandemic, Reese knew there would be no parties, no lectures in big halls, but he was happy to make the best of what he had. What he was not prepared for was isolation, food shortages and non-enforcement of the rules he was trying to stick to. As the situation worsened last week, he watched the majority of UK's best students around him evacuate halls and return home. He doesn't... Yeah. He told the BBC, he has not been left trying to comfort... He has been now left trying to comfort other students who have found themselves away from home. He says, feeling abandoned. He said, I've had international students break down in tears over the lack of support the only way i've been able to get food delivered is by calling the emergency security number and it's so uncomfortable doing that and of course you know for sure those emerge those security guards have turned into like what quasi postmate delivery pay people right i'm sure they're probably making a bit of money on top of it as well right um uh what you call it um taxing the students for the deliveries that they're getting but just imagine the stress that these guys are under these guys and girls but again part of me thinks this is maybe beneficial for them in the future going forward in general right the fact that they've been subjected to such harsh and um Compl complicated situations so quickly in their young adult life is probably going to serve them best when they go forward but again man who would have imagined this who would imagine this last year that you'd have a whole group you know, who would imagine this who would have imagined prior to the students going to university this would have happened me anybody could right everybody could imagine this so what you have here is a very clear example of the government purposely sending kids to university knowing full well that most likely it was going to um, result in a surge in cases, right? But they wanted to ensure that the landlords got their money or whoever owned these apartment blocks, most probably not just regular landlords that are middle-class people trying to make a buck. It's probably private equity firms, private, you know, contracting firms, whoever they are, people that have got ties to the, you know, Houses of Parliament, people that have got ties to some of those lofty, ofty, um, eaten mandem. Right, they wanted to make sure those guys got in. They wanted to make sure they paid the tuition fee because I'm sure they get kickbacks on that as well. Allegedly, I don't know if that's true. Don't sue me, but I'm, I'm sure that is true. And then suddenly now they lock them in their room and say, "Oh, we we're so surprised and shocked by it." This was definitely a play. It was all a game. It was all a game. They could have, they, they would have, they should have known this from the beginning. They should have obviously offered the opportunity for people to study um, digitally via Zoom, via internet, wherever they can. Right? There should have been that option that if you want to study at home, you can. Which would have, you know, what that would have done. Like the clubbing thing, or like I mentioned previously, the issue with the curfew, right? Isn't that we've got a curfew? It's that the curfew is the same for everybody, right? Nationwide, right? And like, I guess that's the issue that we've had in general with bars and pubs in London, or especially in London where I live, where because they all generally tend to close at the same time, especially if you're like in a trendy area, they all kind of have the same sort of time that they close or you're in like a town centre that basically results in everybody flooding the streets at the same time, right? Which then of course puts the stress on all the emergency services and just the shops in general and it causes a lot of trouble, a lot of antisocial behaviour. Well, part of the reason why countries such as Amsterdam, places such as Berlin, even places like Prague haven't got that issue with antisocial behaviour on the streets after the pubs have closed is because they all close at different times. So some pubs are allowed to stay open at seven. Sometimes can stay open until five. Some pubs stay open until three. So you get such a variation in places that it means that people can start drinking earlier. They don't get as fucked up because they're not in a rush to leave. And then when they do leave, there's not a whole group of crowd of people standing outside at the same time. And this is exactly what happened with the university students, right? They all went at exactly the same time. There was no real option. There wasn't a great number of people. No, well, there wasn't. There were some universities that offered the option of people um, studying uh remotely but most of them encourage students to go back to school because they said schools are the most covid secure places to go and now look what's happened crazy um he said that his accommodation at pollock is catered by one cafeteria and he has no facilities to cook for himself which is insane imagine paying thirty thousand a year and you can't cook for yourself like that's nutty there's no kitchen there's no like one hob and nothing because he's self-isolated in his room, he relies on university to deliver food, but sometimes nothing arrives until after lunchtime. And on Tuesday, he still had nothing done until about 4 p.m. So you're practicing, what, intermittent fasting without wanting to. It, there's nothing worse, right? Diets are crap anywhere as they are, right? They're sort of like a needs... It's sort of like a needs must thing, right? When you're trying to achieve a certain goal, you want to fit into an outfit, you want to, um, you know, um, flex on your ex, whatever it may be. But you don't want to do them out of your free will. You don't want to, especially not, you don't want to be tricked into doing, a, into doing a bloody diet. And imagine doing that at university, right? At one of the worst places to do it because you want to indulge, you want to go a bit crazy, and, but they're making you bloody do this. Mad. As an international student, Reese pays 21,000 tuition fees and 9,000 for accommodation per year to attend the University of Edinburgh. He believes students are from abroad are paying the most and getting the least help. 
Jesus Christ. Again, man, what a shocking state of affairs. Who would have guessed it? We obviously couldn't have guessed it. But again, hopefully they get over it and they figure something out for these students because it's not a really um, advantageous situation to be in. Next on the list. Oh, yeah, this is funny. <laughs> You know me, dog. You know I love to watch these um, public freakout videos, right? And this is probably one of the best ones I've seen lately. And another real one that kind of questions your sanity. Essentially, it's this guy that rocks up to a subway. And I'm guessing for some unbeknownst reason to me, he decides to rock up to a subway without wearing a mask. And this is what ensues. We're bullshit. Help your so he's up he's he's obviously ordering you know international subways right you know you know most of these have been fast food fast food chain fast food fast food chains are the same around the world same layout same ordering process same food same everything you know the drill when you go to subway right there's that really famous amazing joke by sebastian mansako is it Manasako? Yeah, Manasako, yeah. That famous joke about um annoying people at Subway that wait and say, oh, well, what kind of stuff do you have? What kind of bread is there on offer? Um, do you offer stuff toasted? You know I mean, it's like, come on, it's a Subway, love. Like, read the signs. You know I mean, keep it moving. There's nothing more annoying than someone that's kind of dilly-dallying at a kind of, you know, well-known fast food establishment. So this guy knows the drill. And you should know the drill even more so at these fast food chains where they're essentially just doing the bare minimum to ensure that they don't get sued and to ensure no one dies in the establishment. They don't care if you catch COVID. They don't care if you eat a rat. They don't care if a cockroach falls on your shoulder. They just want you to keep paying for your subs, keep playing for your microwaved, um, what you call it, tortilla chips covered in. I used to get that a lot, man, sometime back in the day. I remember some of the things I used to eat. Like I used to get those that box of nachos they'll sell with a little bit of hot sauce and they cover it with some cheese and they put it in a microwave in front of you. Absolutely nuts, right? <laughs> and you pay like four quid for that shit. It's like, what? It's so horrible. Um, but yeah, sub is what it is. It serves its purpose on some occasions. I haven't eaten it in years, literally in years. Um, but yeah, to see this guy sort of like fussing and arguing and citing the CDC, arguing with the employer. And again, like I said, they don't care about your health. They're just doing the bare minimum not so, so they cannot get sued. So if you rock up there without a mask, they're just not going to serve you. They don't want trouble. They don't want any hassle. They just want you to order your food and get the fuck out. And the thing that's really interesting in this exchange is the fact that even if you're, even if you're an anti-masker, you could just rocked up there and just put it on just so you can order the food or even just had it in your hand like that. And just ordered it. Could I get, yeah, I want to get that. Could I get a toasted boo? You could just do this, right? And the lady wouldn't say nothing because, you know, she's working for minimum wage. She doesn't need the hassle. Leave me the fuck alone. I want to go home. And then you can eat it all, get your food and just essentially take it off and just walk out with your with your, with your sub on your hand. You could probably, if you're cheeky, you could probably take it off before you've even stepped out the flipping restaurant. So for this guy to go on such a rampage when all he has to do, the limited he has to do is just put a mask on for two seconds really does make you think that some of these people that are anti-maskers are just being like, because I remember, it's that, it's that Joe Rogan quote in it where he says, oh, Trump gave real assholes in the States an excuse to be assholes, right? Because there was always laying dormant in them, right? That kind of, um, you know, fuck you, middle finger, you can't tell me what to do sort of attitude. And Trump essentially kind of gave those people an excuse to exist or a reason to kind of be shitty. And maybe this mask thing has given people the opportunity to just be a little bit confrontational because, you know, for the most part, everyone sort of knows why you have to wear it. You know, even if you don't agree with maybe the decisions that your government has taken in terms of dealing with it, in terms of lockdowns and in terms of ruining the economy, blah, blah. But in terms of dealing with it in close spaces, you know what the deal is. You know, if you're outdoors, you probably don't need to have it on. You probably don't need to have it on when you're driving in your own car. That's ridiculous, right? But in terms of going to a public space, you probably owe it to yourself and to others to put it on. That's it. It's not that big of a deal. But again, you know, some people think that they the rules are not invented for them. <laughs> exactly such a weird sexual argument isn't it i have the right not to wear a mask and she's quite clearly and rightly saying yes but i also have the right to refuse your service if you're not wearing one and again it's like you know it's such an innocuous thing, isn't it? Do you remember back in the day when you used to be, maybe it's just me, but I remember back in the day when you'd be a little bit embarrassed going into a shop and you basically might have had a smoke. 
you might smoke some weed prior to going to a shop allegedly and you're a bit embarrassed going in there because you're going to stink it up or you might be a bit drunk and you don't want to be a little bit too tipsy around people that aren't tipsy like there was a bit of shame in, introduced or maybe you i don't know you went for a run but you need to go to a shop get some bread and you were you were kind of like a bit shy about people seeing you and you felt disgusting where's that gone where has shame gone Whereas kind of being socially aware and kind of being understanding of the, your fellow neighbours, like the people at the back, like queuing up to get their subway, right? They've obeyed the rules. They want to get their sub. They're not involving themselves in this argument. They want as little hassle as possible. And here you are taking up all the room, all the space. Again, you're not, you know, it's only going to be a minute and a half, but still, man, it's like, where is that kind of thing gone from people? Is it just all the Trump thing? Is it just a populism thing? It's just a state of the world. Like people don't have any sense of like embarrassment anymore. They just feel like, you know, yeah, that's, again, that's Sebastian Man Psycho, isn't it? Aren't you embarrassed? Right? People aren't embarrassed anymore. People just do what they want to do. Like, as if, like, everything they do is justifiable because they, sh what, they've shout loud, loud enough? They read a few memes on Facebook? I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to be Yeah, I, I can't have you. Okay. Lock it? I'm going to have to call. Exactly. Who's he going to call? <laughs> I'm going to call. Who's he going to call? You're breaking the law. You're falling in there. I'm not. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> what? And it's always a... And again, not to be out of order, but it's like that lady from the other day. Um, it's like, well, that they'll fight. Remember that woman from Utah? Um, it, Joe Floyd said he couldn't breathe and that he couldn't breathe. And now we say we can't breathe. And, you know that lady? It's weird that all these anti-maskers, all these anti-lockdown people, um, anti-everything are always the most unarticulate people, right? They don't necessarily have a gift of the gab. They don't, they're not necessarily the most persuasive people. They actually don't have, yes, the thing is, well, there's no sense of persuasion. Like, let me actually try and get you to be on my side. Let me convince you that maybe you're seeing this the wrong way. Let me present you with some evidence. Again, why are you going around to flipping fast food establishments and harassing people working for the minimum wage who just want to do their job with dignity and leave is beyond me, right? Why you'd want to go out kind of teaching everybody that that's a very, that's a, so that's a, so sh that's a kind of psychopathy that I don't know. That I didn't even know existed, but it, I guess it is a thing, right? It, it kind of relates to the whole Karen idea, right? You're going around sort of like uh, policing or nannying a society that doesn't want to be nannied, right? Like, leave me alone. Like, you're not my mom. Do you know what I mean? That kind of idea. Like, that's bizarre anyway. But if you are going to do it, come on, get get your ducks in a row, right? Practice your speech. Practice your little patois. Um, Get your sort of talking points down to a T. Do like, you know, do like what those um people do. Those talking heads like Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens and those type of types when they get attacked on a point and they kind of fire out with like five or six points because they know exactly what, where you're going to come up, where you're going to come from attack wise. They've got their counter arguments lined up, like come that way. But instead they always come with these sort of fumbling, I'm free sort of arguments. It looks like he's missing a couple of teeth, maybe a couple of brain cells. It's like, Jesus, leave the woman alone. Like, you know, hop over to a 7-Eleven or something if you're that desperate for a Subway quality sandwich and keep it moving. Serve my sandwich. I don't need to serve Exactly. No, she does. <laughs> this battle. <laughs> the battle for the Subway. She told me. She already served it, so. Serve my sandwich. Serve my sandwich. Exactly. I want my sandwich. Such a baby, isn't it? such a bait imagine being a imagine this is a thing too people like this have children right this is sometimes when you think to yourself like nature versus nurture some kids just have no chance in it in life right it's actually a um it's actually quite surprising when kids that were born to parents such as this um come out pretty decent it's actually quite surprising you're like wow man that's, that's actually quite impressive your mom and dad are flipping dumb de dums right yeah they're, they're they're like incredibly r-worded um but take that aside imagine you don't have kids you're an adult you're a grown-up like why are you beating on the flipping plexiglass at a subway shouting and screaming like what is wrong with you and again in this situation how far do you really want to escalate what are you going to do hop over the counter and hit her why because she told you to wear a mask to get your flipping four dollar subway really is that what you're really going is that what you really want to get arrested for is that what you really want to inflict bodily bodily harm to somebody for she's not making the rules she's just following the rules because she works there do you know what I mean like what in the hell is this no i'm not wearing the mask and this is also a typical attitude of people in service in service jobs or right? in, in places where like usually the lower the more kind of lower the job is 
the shitty the people that usually come doing that store. I've worked in retail for what five plus years. I worked in retail, and I can guarantee you, you meet some of the worst human. I think yeah, it's diff- it's this way. Office jobs, you meet some of the worst, you have probably the worst colleagues you've ever had in your life, right? Because they're usually entitled, especially when you work in the higher up you go, you go into offices where there's people like that, like 26 who have never worked a regular night, who have never worked in a shop before. They've only just come out of uni. They've had, they've gone straight into a 25K per 25k per year paying job and just work their way up right so they're quite pampered they're quite spoiled they're really entitled so you meet so usually the worst employees you've ever met in an office space and you meet some of the worst customers and human beings in general that you ever meet working in a uh, in a shop or a restaurant or a bar it, you just can't help it. it is what it is and sometimes you'd think to yourself especially when it comes to food you'd have this again colleagues can be one thing because i think you know if you're a shitty colleague usually the shittier colleague you meet usually the better they are at their job so sometimes if you're a crap colleague and you have a bit of a stink at you but you do a really good job it can be forgiven right managers can sometimes kind of leave you alone in the corner there, even though they know most of their staff kind of hate you it is what it is but sometimes you think to yourself, when it comes to food and drink, you'd think there'd be a little bit more respect given to the person serving you because essentially you're eating, you're digesting the things that that person's handing you on a plate or handing you in a cup. You'd want to be a little bit wary of not pissing that person off. And then even when it comes to like a bar thing, you'd imagine like being just being a little bit nice and courteous to the person working around behind a bar might grant you, I don't know, a cheeky little top up on a drink that you didn't pay for or the ability to maybe buy another one. Um, just after um, lockdown or after last orders just whatever or just kind of good graces just extending a bit of karma out there living a bit of a fat tip but no they go there they're the most entitled they want everything they expect everything and they don't want to give everything in they don't want to give nothing in return as well because again you're demanding a sandwich but the only thing that she's requesting you to do is to put on a mask and it's not even her requesting you to do that it's the flipping government i need to breathe i'm free i need to breathe i'm free, I'm, I need to breathe. I'm free. You saw, look at him. Look at this. Look at this doofus. What's your fucking problem? Wearing your fucking mask. Bad boy. Again. What did he get? And again, so he chucked his coke in the bin. He threw some what? Tissues on the floor and stormed out. Embarrassing absolutely embarrassing but again i love these videos they make me laugh and they're definitely a message or and kind of an fyi as to what you shouldn't do when you're in public and you're going getting served by um people in general or just in or just maneuvering in the world man i mean just try and be a decent person especially during these tough times no one again these people are doing you a favor by working there at this time right they're doing you a favor they're doing you a solid they don't need to be there they could be with their families chilling hanging out but instead here they are serving you a bloody shitty sandwich in an in a brightly lit restaurant with a microwave that looks with a microwave that kind of looks like an oven come on man take your food and keep it moving boy what do i know Next on the list, we have this very surprising and interesting news, something a little bit low worthy from The Guardian. It says here, Fred Perry withdraws a polo shirt dotted by the far right pra- Proud Boys. I guess the Proud Boys were the group that were originally founded by Gavin McGuinness, but he's since distanced himself from that group. Um, I think at the cause of one of them, didn't they murder somebody or something like that? I forgot what the, what the cause was. Someone died or something along those lines. They got put in jail. Gavin McGuinness essentially abandoned those guys <laughs> and just continued doing his media career while these guys kind of basically rotted in jail. It was really funny at the time, but hey, um, um, for those guys that are in jail, it probably isn't. So keep your head up wherever you are. Do your thing. But I guess the Proud Boys have come back into the public conversations because they decided to go to Portland or one of those places in the States where they keep having these weird sort of like LARPing um, protest fight things that they have. So the Proud Boys uh, took it upon themselves to basically reinforce law and order, um, go to Portland and basically cause a ruckus. And for some reason, they decide to, some reason their kind of garb of choice is these are these Fred Polo polos with the kind of, uh black and gold motif the ones that you would see you know being worn by skinheads and punk rockers in the uk daily you go to camden you see loads of guys wearing these polos but for some reason they've kind of become a motif a motif for the proud boys and i guess fred perry has seen it and be like no we don't want to be such and again it's funny because when it happens to um when it happens to black people with hennessy 
Do you remember Hennessy and I, I think it might have been Covossier or one of those kind of drinks from Jay, I think that's the Jay-Z area. Do you remember when one of those brands are like, oh, we don't want to be associated with hip-hop, right? And everyone kicked up a stink. Rightfully so, right? That's racist, xenophobic, um, whatever, bigotry, blah de blah 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 whatever itchery or ism you want to use there. But then when Fred, when Fred Perry decided to pull their shirt from the Proud Boys, just no one kind of blinks an eyelid. And again, these guys are deplorable, right? They're, they're absolute Muppets anyway. Any any adult that could go and dress up like they're playing flipping um, Call of Duty to go and supposedly beat up the lips hards, you're a flipping joke as it is. But come on, really? Like Fred Perry withdrawing shirts from Proud Boys, really? Do you think that's going to make any change? What's that going to do? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, continue. The article here says, the fashion brand Fred Perry has pulled one of his famous polo shirt designs after it became associated with the fire organization. A comp the company has halted sales of the black and yellow top in the US and Canada after it was adopted by the neo-fascist group, uh, the Proud Boys. In a statement posted on its website, Fred Perry said it was incredibly frustrating to see the polo shirt and its Laurel wealth being what, um, logo become associated with the group. Uh, the, the, I think the interesting part of it is that you know, of course, they're stopping the sales in the US. That doesn't mean these guys can't order it from abroad. It's flipping stupid. Um, if anything, it's just going to increase the demand for it. You ban it in one place, it's just going to increase the demand for it in other places. And, you know, if people want to get hold of it, they can. But it's interesting to see them doing such a thing because I would imagine there are far more questionable groups in the UK or in Europe alone that have also adopted um, the Fred Perry polo shirt as their motif. So to suddenly take um, arms at it through the US a part of me thinks they don't have that much they don't it's not really yeah a part of me thinks they probably sell a lot more polos in europe anyway so it's not that big of a deal pulling them from the states i would think so because if they try to pull these shirts from the europe especially considering some of the neo-nazi links that they have um associated with dr martins with fred perry with levi's in the europe alone these brands would be dead like they'll be dead in an instant because that's their largest market, right? So I think when you're a fashion brand, you kind of have to maintain a bit of distance. Obviously, it's not, it's not, um, it, it's obviously it, it goes it goes back to the whole idea about um, was it Karl Lagerfeld when he was said that he was offended when fat people wear his clothes or something like that, right? He didn't think fat people should wear his clothes. Um, there is that there is that kind of idea i guess if you're a designer or a creative where you can get sometimes put off by your own fans or people that wear your stuff and wear it in quote unquote the wrong way but i think when you're a fashion brand a company you have to remain somewhat um somewhat neutral in your stance about who can wear or kind of support the brand that you put out there you can't control who your fans are it is what it is you just have to provide the fashion put it out and just keep yourself out of as much as possible now of course the the trouble is if you're one of those brands that always insert yourself into social justice issues then you're going to have to constantly be playing this social justice tennis right making sure you're on the right line all the time but if you kind of just leave that stuff to the actual people that are professionals in it and do your philanthropy do your social social activism on the side quietly without it being associated maybe even your brand you're fine the moment you start virtual signaling this is when it comes back to the ass um the company said it, although it's sought to represent inclusivity and diversity we have seen that the black and yellow fin uh tip shirt is taking on a new and very different meaning in north america as a result of the association of the proud boys the association is something we must do our best to end eh, you shouldn't do that you should just put out shirts and maybe denounce the proud boys as you can or if you want to it continues it says to be absolutely clear if you see any proud boys material or products featuring our laurel or any black and yellow laid items they have absolutely nothing to do with us we are working with our lawyer to pursue an any lawful use of brand again that is so draconian it's so 1984 ish that you're going around telling people what they can and cannot wear what they can and cannot say like what is this that we're doing there's gonna be dickheads dickheads might wear your clothes you just have to put up with it and hope that you can put out enough good energy support the people that you actually want to again they could easily confound this by making a campaign where they supported people who were the antithesis or the complete opposite of what the proud boys stand for and that would probably send a far clearer message than making this weird virtue signaling nonsense about we're gonna withdraw the sales of these shirts in, in the u.s it's like what imagine if they went as far imagine if they went as far as saying that <coughs> we're not, imagine if they went as far as, sorry, as saying we're not gonna sell these shirts to white people 
Imagine, imagine the uproar if they said something along those kind of lines. That's essentially what they're saying, right? We're not going to sell these shirts to white Americans, which is absolutely insane. If you don't want a particular group of people to wear your shirts, maybe try and represent, maybe try and get it represented by the people that you actually want to represent it by. But again, like I said, they have a very, very sketchy history in Europe alone that they probably wouldn't want to address. And I think for the most part, they don't sell that many in the States anyway, so it's not a big of a deal. It continues, Fred Perry was founded in 1952 by a Wimbledon tennis champion of the same name and has been adopted by a very subculture in 60s and 70s polo shirt became associated with the skin of the movement but the brand has repeatedly spoken out against this far right um by far right groups frankly we can't put our disapproval in better words our chairman says in 2017 when his uh, label said in a statement uh, fred was the son of a working class socialist mp who became a world tennis champion at the time uh when tennis was an elite sport he started a business with a jewish businessman hmm, uh, from instant europe <laughs> it's a shame we even have to answer these questions like this no we don't support the ideas of a group but that you speak up it's a com is a counter to our belief and the people who work with us. The Proud Boys were created by Vice Magazine co-founder Gavin McGinnis 2016 in the lead up to Donald Trump's election as president. McGinnis has since distanced himself from the organization and the guys that are in prison, uh, which publicly insist um, it's not all right, all white nationalists, but has a history of glorifying violence and misogyny. In 2018, the FBI classified the organization as extremist group, while the Southern Poverty Law Center said it hit a list of hate groups. Over the weekend, the Proud Boys organized a pro-Trump rally in Portland. As I mentioned, the K, uh, K Brown organization State governor declared a state of emergency anticipation of white supremacist groups coming from out of town, but far fewer people than anticipated showed up. Again, man, this you know that whole LARPing live action role playing is really weird anyway. Between you know people on the far right, people on the far left, but yeah, it's just it's just funny, very interesting, just to see them taking this sort of stance now, considering the amount of damage groups like Proud Boys have done since they've adopted that motif. I don't know if they are are they what I would, I would assume they are white nationalists because I've, I don't know if I've ever seen them. Is there is there a black member of the Proud Boys? They probably do exist. I'm sure there does. There is somebody that's kind of like a self-hating black person that would decide to go in there and kind of do that whole MAGA Trump thing, uh, but done the pro bad motifs, proud boys motifs. So I'm sure they do exist. But again, you, they can be ignored. They can be sort of pushed to the sides, but purposely going out and banning them or refusing them entry in certain places or denying them from buying certain items is only going to boost their notoriety. It's only going to increase their reach. And if you see what happened, especially with the debates in the States, you would know that, oh, great. They actually got a mention on the live debates during, you know, probably one of the most important elections or important, you know, political um, decisions in US history, right? Especially when you consider what's going on with the pandemic. And then you've got two, you know, two presidential candidates one president one sitting president one presidential candidate debating and talking about whether or not they should be denouncing the fucking proud boys right they shouldn't even be mentioned in this in that stratosphere whatsoever but again these stupid virtual signaling actions do nothing uh but boost their signal do nothing but amplify their voice do nothing but rile up people that are going to get offended by it. again like i said they'd be far better served trying to promote the people that oppose everything that proud people the proud boys stand for right getting behind them putting some money behind some actual um organizations and action groups on the ground making actual change within the community then doing all these stupid uh kind of what virtue signaling things that are serving nobody but appeasing some segment of people on social media again really really weird stance from there to take let's continue here what else do we have 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 um oh yeah this is an interesting one so uh um, this is from resident advisor rebecca dj rebecca posts an open letter with for the music pledge against sexual harassment and dance music together we can bring the dance music industry back to its roots now rebecca when she's not crying about the pandemic or trying to crowdsource her opinion crowdsource her own opinion about playing during the pandemic has essentially put herself front and center right who would have guessed it right a big famous dj deciding it's all about me right no 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 gigs no attention so you get behind this kind of cause right cause for against sexual harassment in the, in the industry but then plus your face in front of all the proceeding bits of press and of course here's what we have a story via resident advisor it says rebecca has started an anti-sexual harassment campaign called hashtag for the music the british dj announced a new initiative in an instagram post this week she said after deciding i would like to mentor people to help bring them in the industry like okay great again me 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 it became apparent that i was responsible to do this unless i stood up and tried to like to fight to make the industry a safer all around the for the music hashtag campaign starts with an open letter and petition at the change.org right because everything policies really change with change.org right people change their action you get a petition out there and suddenly 
men all over the dance music scene stop harassing they stop putting their hands on women they don't know they stop forcefully trying to pin women up against the wall they stop taking advantage of up and coming producers and djs they stop um charging exuberant fees to up and coming promoters and djs and whatever else it may be that's what they do hashtag for the change or oh, what's for the music whatever nonsense it is let's see what the petition has got so far anyway in terms of numbers i'm sure it's got up to, it's probably exceeded its target because you know anyone could bloody sign an email a bloody uh petition again only three thousand considering it's a petition where you just have to add your first name last name and email that's pretty poor isn't it right and no place to the dance music industry so let's read what she says here um hello dearest dance community it's me your friend i i i i'm the woman i i i um behind the decks so the one you invite to conduct the show i'm the person of color in the first row person of color dj rebecca is a person of color what that's a person of color what am i then in this world that we live in now what am i am i a person of color or am i like or am i indigenous like what am i am i like native what am i then if she's a if she's a person of color wow okay fair enough man let's continue um she's a person of color i guess isn't it blah 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 <laughs> what's good the rebecca is insane bro she's nuts bro um a person of color i'm the artist liaison the lgbtq sound engineer the migrant girl behind the bar i guess she's just, okay i don't ask much from you this is just this basically from the third person i'm assuming right i don't know from you i often complain i love music and the long nights and the things but tonight i want you to know that when i put my dancing shoes on i'm doing it for the music and nothing more okay um, i say it's because it isn't the first time i've hit the decks and has face sexism as i play the set i say it's because it isn't the first time i've had to dodge through the weird wandering hands in the artist area which insist um on systemically trying to visit unconsenting places across my body as i do you know what this sounds like it sounds like one of those um erotic novels isn't it that your mum reads right this is a bit weird isn't it like really if you're trying to make a point about you know about um sexual harassment within a dance music scene maybe not don't try and sex it up in it i say it's because it isn't the first time i have had girls from my country are easy i say it's because it isn't the first time i've been told to submit i'll never work in this industry again i say it's because it isn't the first time so today i might remind you again the the okay she's just she's gonna keep talking with this weird voice can we just get to an actual statement about this thing uh, the, so the music industry has changed and within this it has its people it's not the industry i came to be a part of and my friend this isn't the industry that you came here for either music was born from desire to, for a safe space a place of freedom and love for artistic expression a place that stood for something in music we found purpose a high calling but somehow along the way through our journey we let we we let we let djs become gods and suddenly they stopped becoming accountable for their actions um i don't say we um would it, is, it, is it a collective thing yeah probably let's i agree with the first bit i think the safe space thing is definitely true i think i've said this before and someone pulled me up and it said oh safe space it can't be a safe space of course it it can be a safe space i think you can hold out hope that you can create this little utopia for yourself especially if you're a promoter or a club owner there is a way to purpose there is a way to sort of um purposely build and cultivate a community um, with a shared sort of belief shared sort of outlook on the world that can then re relate to being a safe space of course there'll be occasions when some kind of snakes will crack through the uh, will kind of slip through the cracks but for the most part it is possible to maintain a certain kind of vibe in a club in a space especially with people with their tops off and running around naked and doing whatever they want to do you can do that it just takes a lot of effort and time now of course as the scene has grown and it's become more commercial more regular everyday folk have kind of seeped through the cracks and establish themselves things can change but i think that's definitely possible it says here rape sexual assault and sexual harassment unwanted attention misogynist and sex obstruction are at the uh what we encounter as we try to simply do our jobs this is a price tag we pay we're paying for it that i would agree with to some extent i just think it's an issue with nightlife in general i think in general nightlife can be problematic because it's at night people think they can get away with a lot more nonsense i do think the more niche the scene gets is it's weird i, I think the more niche the scene is the more smaller of a kind of subculture it's serving the more the more opportunity there are for bad actors to come in 
and take advantage of those that are in that scene, especially those who are kind of have some level of notoriety, some level of influence. They can use that to somehow coerce, manipulate, groom, whatever you may be called, people coming up in the scene. That's really an issue. It actually goes, it actually kind of scales from the smaller scenes to the really bigger scenes, right? The bigger scenes where you're just nothing but another pretty face behind a row of girls standing behind Solomon and to one of the smaller sort of collectives that kind of put on nights at the yard, right? There's obviously going to be harassment and I want to attention on both um, areas but what's needed is like for the community within itself to sort of police itself right for everyone within this look yeah especially if you're putting a night on you should be you should be aware enough of some of the bad actors that are in there and sort of making your way to sort of eradicate that kind of behavior all those people within that scene but anyway, let's go back to the ra article because she's going to keep waffling on here about mad stuff in it right so let's go back here she's got three and a half thousand signatures it says here yeah, um the Ford music campaign starts with an open letter it says we have our jobs we have our careers our credibility our reputations is by speaking yeah. out she sent an open letter she said uh labeled promiscuous um beings deserving of violence um we are told that our cuts and bruises mean nothing if aimed at those with gentle faces and uh, high followings but not anymore we have stayed quiet and never went public but not anymore we try to do it privately and find ourselves unheard but not anymore why is she writing like this for can someone explain is, is it because she's what writes her own music or something why can't she just write it normally why does it all sound like some weird um women's march speech or something like this is so bizarre um in the last weeks again it's probably maybe because it's just all coming from her own voice again this is this is where it comes that whole narcissism comes from a minute right it's, it's something that's meant to benefit women within a scene overall but it's always coming from her point of view so she's trying to show off her writing and artistic chops right i'm sure she's got comments underneath her picture saying oh my god i like the, the the writing you did was amazing heart and she's like oh my god thank you so much i'm just getting back into writing actually because i'm not djing too much so, oh, god almighty this, she's insufferable sometimes rebecca man she's got a pure heart don't get me wrong but bloody hell it's all about me um in the last few weeks we've seen our community divided it continues willful ignorance slut shaming and the mistrust of victim testimonies in the face of systemic and rampant abuse has left many of us questioning if those founding values of love and freedom that we all came for have finally been lost uh, to a status quo which allows for abuse of power which encourages and glorifies even yeah i think that's true i think eric Mueller case is definitely a bit of a sobering one it definitely showed that some people are much more forgiving if the person's got a lot of clout if they're well known if they're well liked then whatever they do can be excused to some certain extent and again this isn't what jack master did this isn't anything near it right this is actually somebody purposely getting girls allegedly drunk um getting them intoxicated um getting them high or whatever else happened and and purposely taking advantage of them sexually right that's what essentially was accused of and he was in the process of being charged in the court of law for that before his untimely passing in eric Mueller. so you can definitely understand why some women in the scene are like what the fuck is going on especially when you see you know people like jamie jones and stuff but posting eulogies about this guy and saying he had these issues right again this isn't somebody that um um i don't know got into a fight with somebody at a bar and pushed him and he smashed his on the floor and he died right from a brain aneurysm this isn't like some sort of like yeah this isn't that sort of vibe this is somebody um system systematically taking advantage of young women especially people that are coming up in the scene and sort of like you know um flexing his influence and power over them to take advantage of them in a very uh sexually forward way right it's just it, again reading back thinking back on that whole story makes me just think like wow i can imagine though people actually legitimately excusing eric Marino's behavior mad isn't it so it continues here it says there are predators in our scene and this must not be tolerated any longer we can no longer excuse the behavior of the high profile is because they are high profile anymore it says participants are encouraged to print out the for the music poster or create their own and post a black and white photo of themselves of course that's what she wants them to do of course because there's a chance for her to post a picture of herself oh god rebecca's exhausting so this is obviously the image of it on there the whole text written on her account and i'm sure she's got many other people probably lined up doing the same thing on the two lives actually check her accounts who are sure she posted who actually posted the hashtag it's a bit cringe again um these sort of like open statements and hashtag things probably don't do anything to change people's attitudes and behaviors i think it's something that kind of goes it actually goes beyond um that it goes beyond scenes i kind of, i think it does go beyond scenes like i said this i'm sure does affect this you saw it with burger records right they had a very they had a lot of issues with burger records with some of their labels uh bands but even some of the female-led bands right that were purposely turning a blind eye to some of the abuse that was happening there because they were unwilling to um 
kind of jeopardized their position, right? There was still, I remember there was one particular band that that knew that one of the other bands was taking advantage of a girl that happened to be underage and they didn't want to say nothing because they didn't want to jeopardize their position in the, on the label. Like just some purely disgusting, abhorrent things, right? Which again goes to show that there maybe is an issue in general in society with um, sexual assault and people taking advantage of women within scenes. Now, this might be a Jordan Peterson reason where he says he kind of argues that men and women haven't worked that long in the workplace, so there's bound to be some sort of issues going on because we've only been working in the workplace for let's say 40 years right and kind of like shared rooms and places and um, there isn't any sort of gender divide maybe there is a, a some disparity when it comes to pay but in terms of jobs you're not necessarily working in women only companies or women only floors or men only rooms there is kind of people kind of mingling and kind of connecting in places and you're spending eight hours a day with people and the lines get blurred and i'd imagine even in light life i'd imagine being a professional dj wandering in places wanting connection the lines get drawn things get a bit messy blah 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 blah. it can get a bit mad but still i maintain we should be we should always provide a safe space for people within our scene especially women you should take care of them no questions asked i've been in many different occasions in places especially in clubs especially in, in house parties where the girls got a bit too drunk got a bit too excited people have, you know some people in the room are wanting to take advantage of and i along with some other of my friends would be like nah let's put her in an uber let's send her home and stuff because no one thinks that's a win no one thinks that's a that's that's a win right getting with a girl that's completely out of her face just because you can that's not what we should be we should be teaching guys to obviously carry themselves better we should obviously be teaching women too to obviously make sure they keep their head on a swivel and don't leave themselves in a position where they're essentially surrounded or around in a room full of strangers that they don't know sharing drinks doing all manner of stuff that isn't the case but we should be looking after each other in some way shape or form but again do i think looking after each other is printing out a hashtag on a bit of paper and you know putting it in front of your beautifully made up face on a balcony somewhere right and writing a whole soliloquy essay thing that sounds like a speech that sounds like some kind of weird prose that you'd see on tumblr probably not but again it's a start i guess in some way shape or form check out the petition if you want to i'll link it in the show description for those of you that are interested all right okay let's move on so many things to get through here what's the what is the time here okay cool let's move on that is not there oh um of course go on here congratulations to joe budden he has launched his own network called the joe budden network and his first show that he's announced is called see the thing is hosted by these three lovely ladies here on the screen um the captions is the following and now we have to get some fun i always say on the pod that there are too many topics that we can't um shouldn't touch and that women um get to have all the fun so i'm extremely he always does this always pandering to women and it's just like yuck enough we get it star signs and all this sort of nonsense that come on we get it we get it um uh, da, da, da. so i'm extremely proud to eager to introduce our new podcast see the thing is featuring bridget kelly mandy b and olivia dope i know bridget kelly is just that young lady here she's been on the podcast a few times she's one of the rare again it's very difficult i guess when you have a very you find it a lot you know, sometimes with the stand-up comedian podcast apart from your mum's house with christina p and tom segura they're probably one that's probably one of the rare ones but it's very difficult to find a podcast or a show where there's funny boys and men and bo there's funny men and when men and women and they're able to be funny in the same level without it turning into like let me impress him or her it's i don't know what that is i'm not sure if it's a sexual engine thing i'm not sure if it's just like a get a lot of funny people in a room regardless of gender they're gonna always try to out funny each other but it can be very difficult to make that work especially when you add on top of it when you add on top of it like the fact that you know the joe Biden podcast is a pretty misogynist sort of like male-led podcast right most of their topics have a very um forward male lean well, yeah they're very much male leaning they sort of come from the male gaze it is what it is right they are all men on there unapologetically so it can be difficult to sort of put a woman in there and make it make sense but i guess bridget kelly was definitely one of the best ones there because i'm assuming she hangs out with those dudes they're actually real friends outside of the podcast so i'm assuming this show will probably be the same sort of vibe as the joe Biden show but obviously more so pointing towards the ladies and again it's cool to see because it does definitely goes to show that joe Biden is thinking about building an entire network i think that was one of the kind of um criticisms that people had about him supposedly asking spotify for 250 m's was that you know they're not going to pay that for you they need to have more than that right so now he's basically going to show and prove um that he is going to basically have a better platform a better list of shows than someone like the ringo who essentially got paid big bucks for essentially nothing so if he can prove even just with just doing two shows that don't include his face on it he's definitely one and and that will definitely put him in a position where the next round of negotiations are going to the prices that they're going to be quoting are going to be 
astronomical. So don't be surprised if the next round of negotiations when Joe Biden um, takes his network out for bidding again or, you know, puts it out there for sale or wants investors to come on board. Don't be surprised if that 250 million M's figure definitely gets uh, matched or or kind of or matched or they get close to getting that. Don't be surprised. I can definitely see that happening. It says here. Uh, Bridget, you are about to kill it in this space and I'm just happy to watch. Mandy, this is a long time coming for us. You've already seen the success in this space, but watch this, LOL. Olivia, I've always had a thing for. Brooklyn Girls, such a, 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 quote, a bracket comedy star. Starting the 10th of the 6th every Tuesday. Thereafter, you can hear these amazing ladies talk their shit on most DSPs. Not sure what they'll say because I'm staying out of women's business, LOL, but they're bold, committed, opinionated, and have a lot to say. Hopefully, that wasn't too mushy. But yeah, also, Awesome to see man I'm, I'm eager to see how that develops going forward the see the thing is um on the joe Biden network i'm assuming it's going to be on his youtube channel too and of course on all digital streaming platforms ba -ba 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 -ba. next on list here before we leave i want to congratulate shola from bon appetit who has landed her own show on binging with babish network on youtube as well and her own show that she's going to be doing which looks pretty amazing um you would know um shola from bon Bon Appetit, but mostly based, of course, on the drama that was taking place with uh, Condé Nast, where there essentially were pay discrepancies with some of the people of color that worked on uh, the Bon Appetit channel. I've only discovered Bon Appetit in the last year or so, and it's been a real um, guilty pleasure to me to watch. It's been a bit of an excruciating ple pleasure. It's been an excruciating watch here because most of the people on there are like, it's, you know, really raging hardcore hipsters. So it's hard to kind of stomach sometimes when they're being a little bit pretentious but once you get over that they're really kind of you know pure souls that just love cooking love connecting with people and um definitely get a lot of cool recipe ideas on there and one of the standout characters on that channel was definitely shola and um, unfortunately she tried to negotiate with um conde nas and they essentially uh said in a very loud voice we don't care about people of color um if you don't accept what we're paying you then you can bounce and she decided to bounce and luckily she ended up in the trusting and loving arms of benjamin babish another really cool um, food channel on youtube and this is the article here from deadline it says chef restaurateur and media personality shola el wali whose exit from the condé nas bon appetit helped spark a reckoning of the work culture at the company in the media business is headlining her own series stump shola the show will launch to thursday on binge with babish network which has 7.7 .7 million subscribers and i'm funny too because i'm assuming she's probably gonna end up getting way more views on there than she would have done on bon appetit simply based off the back of the drama and of course based on the fact that she's an amazing cook so you know it's all benefit benefit and i'm sure it's far more than any tv program that she would have got pitched for it's just amazing so cool for her its regular slot will be saturdays and the show has 10 episode order amazing and it's great how they treat in youtube channels like flopping television networks as they should because again the production quality on benji rebabish is just really really sky high it says on stomp shola the host will create a meal in a particular style but before doing so she will need to spin the game show like will and find out how she is going to be challenged one simple mission um one simple mission sorry make a seven course dinner but all the ingredients must be purchased at a convenience store El Awali said um she's excited for a new show not only did it get, I get to spin that giant wheel what but no matter where it lands I know we're gonna have a good time the wheel is not is some wild things going on and I can't wait to try it all cook one-handed light stuff on fire and even try to beat the babish himself oh yeah let's look at the list here um it says here make it sad 18th century so yeah some really cool options there going forward said um, Andrew Ria a chef and film filmmaker and author who founded the Binjiri Babish Network will appear on Stump Shola and said it is an extraordinary honour to have her in the fold her acknowledged humour and personality make her reflective of everything great about what YouTube has to offer and it's thrilling for her to join us and be a new addition on BC on the Babish Culinary Universe earlier this year long gathering tensions among the staffers and former contributors over Bon Appetit was run under former bon <laughs> Adam Rapporteur spilled onto public view Rapporteur Rapper Paul Sawyer resigned um, under a card in June. I oh, remember that, right? The blackface picture. And with the print ads in decline, the company had floored the accelerator on the original video and garnered a massive social media following of viewers and attracted its test kitchen videos. And Lawali was among the several contributors to cut ties with the company over financial inequality, inequity, sorry, and a workplace that, by its own ambition, has been far too white for far too long. And that was really, and again, I like, again, that conversation about workplace diversity and representation is annoying. It can be frustrating, but this was really a kind of like um 
um, on the button cold case about, you know, uh, companies basically taking advantage of people who are willing to work for cheap at the beginning, but then willing to get paid their, um, you know, uh, standard rate or rate at least applicable to their white counterparts. And, and Condé Nest was like, now nah, we don't do that over here. So again, um, maybe it's a lesson about reading your reading your contract prior to signing maybe it's a lesson in making sure you negotiate what you're worth at the beginning so you're not kind of retroactively kind of going back on trying to do that later on down the line i think we see that with joe budden to some extent but again there is obviously a bit of a train with condé nas and they also they go out of their way to mistreat some of the let's say um people from um ethnic backgrounds or they don't try and even negotiate or meet them in the middle and then sign away which is really interesting considering that the bon appetit uh brand is on, only really exists via youtube right it doesn't necessarily exist on any kind of other platform the print magazine is essentially dead no one probably buys that to the extent it was getting bought beforehand most of the views and the um sort of clicks definitely came directly from this youtube channel which was growing at the time and really kind of exception ex, ex, um uh growing in a very steady way they had these live conferences and shows that they were doing it was going in a really upward trajectory so for them to suddenly decide to kind of again the other rapper poor thing is a bit unfortunate don't get me wrong right no one could have envisioned him getting caught you know in blackface uh, whatever that he was doing right cultural preparation no one could have guessed that but you could easily replace him with somebody else or maybe hot or kind of you know um giving the job to somebody in-house but to then suddenly let the whole thing come tumbling down just because you weren't willing to renegotiate is really um deeply annoying for the fans of Bon Appetit but again going forward for um, Shola I'm sure it's a big thing for her so in addition to calling out the roster Rappaport who left after brown face photo surfaced um, she charged um, that she learned, earned less than her less qualified co-workers and was not paid at all for video appearances unlike white colleagues Ella Wali who is um, Bengal from Bengali heritage wrote on Instagram that she was often shown on camera in a token fashion, pushed in front of video in display of diversity. Conan has constructed operations, reconstructed operations at Bon Appetit and last month hired Dawn Davis as its new editor. The company um, was one of several put under a harsh spotlight amid the employee unrest as the makeup of the media and institutions has been scrutinized amid nationwide protest. So yeah, big up Shola. Congratulations to her. Um, Benjamin Badger put his money where his mouth is, gave her a show. It's going to be a success, hands down, because she's a freaking great cook and a great personality on social and on media. So that's going to be a success. There's no way about that one. Next on the list, moving on. What do we have here? Ba, 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 ba. Let's talk about this, actually. Let's go here. Uh, reload it's gonna reload or not there we go it's reloading so um i'm sure i mentioned i mentioned already on here right about the whole toy lane's album day star which i thought was flipping phenomenal um i think I'm, most most people have kind of agreed on that um i think that's basically the general consensus but it is interesting to see the media blackout that's basically happened with his project and the 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 kind of wanton uh blackballing or uh, what the, or sabotaging of his album which you've never really seen happen before and again this definitely goes back to my theory that i think a lot of people who feel like they landed on the wrong side of history when um the chris brown and rihanna situation happened back in the day i think now going out of their way to rewrite their wrongs by making sure they punish uh tory lanes for any ab abhorrent any alleged crime or apparent crime they think that he's guilty of when it comes to the incident involving megan Thee stallion and the shooting that night in la so far no no evidence points to the fact that he had a gun on his possession or no they had a gun in his hand or that he shot her in any kind of way the evidence that we've seen so far about her getting quote unquote shot doesn't look like she got shot in the first place so that is even in question and we don't actually necessarily have any evidence pointing to the fact that he was actually the gunman that actually fired a bullet and from the beginning until now he's always maintained his innocence now of course Megan Salin is free to think what she thinks about who exactly um, inflicted bodily harm on her but for the people outside of it right for fans and media platforms Forms such as us well for fans like myself and media platforms all the world around like i've got up here on the screen they owe it to themselves to be as neutral as they can possible so that when the chips do fall and when the verdict does come in one way or the other they can then make a reasoned response to it but if you're going out your way to basically blackball and to essentially put out these really damaging headlines um about uh toy lanes now when the evidence does come out that he essentially didn't do what you said he'd done right and the story the actual legit story doesn't actually relate to anything that's actually happened or has been reported in the media what are they going to do 
that's the issue. And again, this goes back to me saying that as much as there's no gatekeepers in terms of music, you can just upload your songs on SoundCloud. You can put them up on TuneCore and get them and, uh, um, you can, and get them distributed on all the digital streaming platforms. There still is this thing where if the people behind the scenes, the actual power players decide to put a press pause on your career or to press stop or to press skip, it essentially can affect your career in the long run, especially if you're trying to be a pop star, which I assume Tory Lanez is trying to be. You're trying to be uh, bigger. You're trying to be as big as you can, right? You're trying to cover as many bases. You're trying to reach as many people in the world. You're not just, because I think it's different. If you just focus on your own fans and you have a very loyal, diehard fan base, it doesn't matter who cancels you or who kind of stops you, your ability to make music or no, your ability to put out the music that you want because your fans are always going to find it. But if you want to be the next Drake, like I'd imagine the Tory Lanez is, you know, envisioning himself being in the long run, then it very much hurts your career to have these platforms that you need to have good relationships with um, going out of their way to tarnish your name so you have here a screenshot from this account called blanco Tar blanco tarantino tv that says the following it's got a screenshot and says, um, caption says many of the biggest publication outlets on the internet have come together to seemingly counsel Tory Lanez. and again this is without trial right without him being uh, judged in the court of law they're all coming out and canceling him directly and it's funny because if i remember correctly Tory and six nine got a lot more um got a lot more of a uh got a lot more benefit of that in the beginning because people were like oh let's wait until the case comes out right but the rumors of him cooperating with the feds were you know surfacing from the minute he kind of walked into that jail cell or walked into the yeah or walked into jail cell and i think he kind of confessed as much on the interviews that he's done so far saying that you know he decided to snitch the instant he got into jail the first night so that wasn't a, a surprising thing but some people will will give six nine a benefit of doubt in the beginning of his case but are not willing to give Tory Lanez a benefit of doubt in this case too and again this isn't like saying one or one is a liar or not it's just remaining neutral and saying i don't know i don't have the information and when i have the information i'll make a decision or it's not my business but it's not happening instead people are making it their business coming to the wrong conclusion or coming to the conclusion that only kind of favors one person and then when it gets proven that what you said or what your decision that you made wasn't necessarily true what are you then going to say those same people that are so quick to judge are not going to come back again and apologize they probably won't so this is from vulture headline here screenshot said if you're a real hottie you should skip the tory lane album daystar entirely and stream megan stallion sugar instead which is stupid because you're still promoting tory Heist Nobiety, one of the worst flipping uh, fashion menswear sites on the planet, says the following. Congrats on the most toxic album of the year. This is the last time we will cover Toy Lanes. As if anybody cares about the opinion of a Berlin-based streetwear magazine when it comes to hip-hop. Who gives a shit? Anyway, continues. Complex Toy Lanes, Day Star is much worse than just a terrible album. It, it, you know, And again, what are you going to do? Sus suspend belief by telling us it's a crap album? It's not. You know it isn't. We, me, and, me and you know it isn't a crap album. You might not like him as a person based on what you think he might have done, but objectively, you can't say the album's bad. You cannot, because it's not. It's really good. It might it, it might arguably be one be, be one of the best R&B quote album releases of the year. In that, I mean in a contemporary R&B way. I don't mean in a singy singy R&B way, because that would definitely be Brandy, uh, B7. But in terms of just what this kind of hip-hop r&b hybrid whatever that sound is it's 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 a it's, it's a it's a it's a winner you got here anti fantano that absolute muppet saying what tory lanes is trash we don't care about his opinion and you've got belivity news saying the same thing tory lanes does not support black women as such does not support black people and again so weird right you have an experience of a black woman that and you basically argue on the facts and suddenly you don't you don't support all black women like it's just insane just just insane and then to carry on from that i guess um academics had a bit of an opinion or had something to say regarding this as well same thing but he, he lent himself um the following caption said should dsps punish artists who are accused of domestic violence or snitching on artists whose in general behavior and opinion are controversial and doesn't align to the same in society so this obviously goes back and kind of relates to the comedians thing right where a lot of stand-up comedians are complaining that essentially netflix are quick to put on a program or a movie such as cuties that i watched and reviewed on the channel uh, a couple of days ago but but they're then quick to then take down specials from comedians because they include some racy jokes or whatever it may be but then they have an entire library on spotify especially if you're spotify because you know, spotify have comedy albums on their platform too they have an entire library sometimes with from artists who have have some fairly questionable 
um, you know, questionable smudges on their record, let's say, right? But it, that's never in question. So again, what is the rule? Should these platforms be simply an arbitrator or a platform for artists to... Should there be a publishing platform or should be a, there be a platform where they basically aggregate content, right? Online, where you essentially, as long as you can upload it, you upload it. Or should there be publishers where they are stipulating what is included in their platform? And this is what academics have to say. The moment where like DSPs really start blackballing and really start trying to keep certain artists out for their behavior, I feel like that's when DSP takes a turn and exactly. feels like radio. Like exactly. granted, like, you know, I understand the six nine thing, but in the same breath it's like he cooperated. <laughs> like when did when did DSPs punish you for cooperating with the government? Why exactly. are they getting involved exactly. in you know street code and street things? Um and and that's what I and that's what I've said from the beginning. You cannot like Six Nine as much as you want, right? Six Nine, I don't agree with his actions. <clears throat> I think Ness, is, I don't even agree with his reasonings. He essentially put, you know, he can say what he wants about you know um, so and so sleeping with his baby mother, but he essentially put a lot more people in prison, exposed a lot more other people in hip hop too, um, who had nothing to do with it. What for? What for the betterment of his, of his own career? And he knew exactly what he was getting into prior to him obviously getting involved in that gang. But for Spotify to turn around and say, "Oh, we're not going to put him on a spot on a playlist. We're not going to promote his album. We're not going to even notify his fans when his album drops on there," is completely over the line. And again, if you can do it to Six Nine, you can do it to anybody. So as much as Six Nine is an abhorrent character and he is um, a bit of a nuisance in the scene, if they can do it to him, they can do it to your favorite rapper as well. If they do something un um untoward outside of music or even within music and that's not where that, that, that's what their place i don't think at all and i don't know it's, it's just a little weird to me dsp's jobs should not be to have that moral compass exactly it's it's to be to be a distribution point for the music nothing else Basically. in everything i do i always say just tell me the rule and make and make sure even if it applies with me first make sure you apply to everybody else spotify tried that approach where they were like, hey, listen, let's just be uniform across the board. It's easier to pick on one artist than it is to pick on a bunch. Once it took a couple of artists off that really mattered, the label starts saying, well, slow down, buddy. We own you. You're not doing that. The moment where like DSP. Basically, and, that's, and, I, and I definitely agree with him. And I think that's that's one of the issues I have with it. Of course, Spotify playlists have got a bit of a overrated kind of reputation anyway. I don't think many people, I don't think the playlists are as important as most people think they are. I think if you're a fan of music, you, when you suddenly, when you do go on Spotify for the first time, you might end up kind of latching onto some of their, you know, pre-made playlist but once you start getting into using spotify and actually become a little bit more comfortable using the platform you, you obviously naturally will start populating your own playlist making your own stuff sharing it with your own friends and if you're if you like the artists that you like and even if they are blackboard you're still going to find a way to kind of keep up to date as to when they're releasing new stuff especially if you're following them on social media there's no way that they can kind of stop your career in that regard but the ability for them not to notify people and not to put it on the banner especially on apple music you know, Six Nine didn't have even his album on there in terms of new releases. That is obviously beyond the pale. That goes way over the top in terms of what their remit should be in that regard. So I think they definitely overset the mark in that one going forward. And I think it's definitely going to be a bit of a watershed moment with some artists. Like, what happens when you get an artist that's very well liked, but also does something that's very, very questionable? Um, whether it's murder, whether it's rape, something very questionable. What do they do? Do they retroactively go back and delete all their music? Do they delete their music from the point of the accusation or the point of the charge or the point of the guilty verdict? What do they do in that respect? I'll be interested to see what the solution is going forward but again these are some things that are probably aren't paid enough for me to talk about really in that respect but yeah it's just to see going forward but anyway an hour 40 a bonus episode today so thanks once again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company um if it's actually on zinger show episode number 381 as per usual if it's your first time listening to the show make sure you smash the like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you listen via the podcast app, please make sure you leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends of course if you want to support the show via patreon smash that link down below subscribe for one dollar get access to the show before anyone else gets it and i'll see you again very very soon take care people be safe peace